Um, what I want to do today is uh, talk about two things. Um, sort of, you know, the title is, you know, what I learned as a space cadet. I consider myself a space cadet. Um, and I want to talk about how I arrived at where I'm at today and have some tools and techniques which you might find useful in your own careers. Uh, and then I want to talk about space because I'm a huge space buff. I love space, everything about space. And I think we've just begun to enter what I consider to be the true business of space. I mean, before it was a space race, now it's a space collaboration. And so those are the two things that I, that I want to uh, touch upon today. So first, a little bit of background. Um, most of my peer group got interested in space via the Apollo program, the program that was spent a significant fraction of the nation's GDP, United States, to put humans in the moon. It was a very clear deadline, a very clear mandate by, by President Kennedy. Man, moon, decade. And that towards the 19, uh, 1960s, uh, the first launches occurred, and the teacher would wheel in this old black and white TV set into the classroom, and we'd all sit there and we would watch the launch. And uh, that just caught my imagination. That was it for me. Um, the, the, the next launch, we didn't have TV sets in every classroom, so our classroom didn't get the, get the watch launch, so I pretended to be sick. I went into our bathroom and took a, a, a thermometer and a match, and I put the match in the, the thermometer and it exploded. So that was the beginning of my experience in combustion sciences. Um, my mom took pity on me, let me stay home anyways, and I sat on my couch upside down like the astronauts, did the countdown, five, four, three, two, one, at blast off, and watched another launch. Um, I wrote to NASA, and you see on the right a picture that I got from NASA in this packet. Unfortunately, that's the only picture I have left, but I've kept that picture ever since. It's, it's a grainy photo, it's, it's authentic, uh, it's one of my most cherished possessions. And so that's, that's how I really got interested in this field called space. Um, at, at that point in time, I, I started, as I got older, continued to experience and experiment in combustion sciences. I mean, what little kid would love to have a little model rocket with, a, with an engine that, that actually, you know, spontaneously combusts in a controlled fashion? You can see here some, some of the rockets I still have. It's interesting enough, I still keep these. They're kind of beat up, they're kind of worn. I'm not sure they're flight worthy anymore. I think the quality control is probably out of them. But I still keep them just because they're mementos of my childhood and, and what I was drawn to when, when I entered this field of space. Uh, I decided to go uh, to, before, when I was going to college, I thought about what I wanted to do, and I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, unfortunately, these, my glasses, prohibited me from doing that. And so a good buddy of mine said, hey, well, if you can't fly them, why don't you design them? And so that's when I said, you know what, I think I'll do that. So I went to school, got an aerospace engineering degree, got a master's in system engineering, and I built satellites. Satellites on the left. I built all kinds of satellites. I worked on GPS, I worked on communication satellites, I worked on the remote sensing satellites that bring you Google Earth. Uh, I worked on the very first rovers that went to Mars. So it's kind of cool to be able to say I have hardware on another planet. Um, and I worked on a lot of science missions. And, um, and then eventually I went from engineering to program management, from program management to a P&L responsibility where I actually managed launch vehicles. So I actually managed the vehicle that took those satellites into space. And, and there's a phrase we use, and that is, without lift, there is no space. Those satellites are cool looking, in my opinion, but they do you no good when they sit in the high bay of the factories. So you need to have lift. And that's where I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, where a lot of the entrepreneurialism is occurring, is in the lift field. But, but I didn't want to tell you about my background in the sense of trying to say, here's my family photos and here's my pet dog, but to give you some ideas of what I learned in the course of 30 plus years, which is all about being resilient. So, so what is resiliency? Well, resiliency is the ability to um, um, recover quickly from difficulties. Now, career resiliency is just ad adjusting to career change to adapt to market demands. So your market's gonna change. You know, whatever field you choose, I can guarantee you, and I think it's true for everybody in this room, you entered into a market and it changed over, uh, over time. Either you became less interested in that market, or you didn't like the job you were doing, or maybe it was the environment that you're in, or maybe you were commuting too much. But there's always one aspect of any career that says, wow, it'd be perfect if I could change this, or it'd be perfect if I got more responsibility, for example. Um, you know, I was young, I was a young system engineer at uh, Rockwell International, and I wanted to be a, a lead. And I remember going to my uncle, who was a very successful businessman, and he said, well, how old are you, Robert? And I go, oh, I'm 27 years old, sir. And he goes, like, what person in their right mind would give a 27-year-old that kind of responsibility? And he was absolutely correct, because we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars you know, invested to build that satellite. And so what I learned was 
that as you are faced these obstacles, as you face these challenges, you need to pivot. And that's a word you're going to hear a couple times today. And I pivoted from engineering to program management to, to what I'm doing now, which is uh, I just quit a Fortune 50 company to do a startup. I hope it's successful. We're going to give it all we got. But um, it was something that I chose to do. And I'll tell you some techniques that we learned to do that. Um, and the first technique is defining what's important to you. It's really important to do this. It's really important to write down the list of things. And, and this is a list I wrote about my mid-career. About 17 years ago, I wrote this list. And it's still valid today. Um, and you can think about these. And your list may be different. Um, that's OK. But you want to be able to say, what are the things that are important? Now, the unfortunate thing with this list is you look at it and you say, well, I want it all. You know, I want everything. But the fact is, some things are more important than other things. So, so how do you determine what's more important? Well, technically, and, I, and you, know, you probably thought as an engineer I wouldn't be presenting a matrix to you, but I'm sorry to say that I'm going to do some matrix manipulation today. So what you do is a, it's a technique called the analytical hierarchical process, AHP. Simply put, you just do a pairwise comparison between item A and item B. Is item A less important, of equal importance, or greater importance? And I just fictitiously filled this, this chart out. So you can go anywhere from a, uh, you know, negative five to a positive five, or you know, fractions. It's different ways of doing it. And, and you can see, when I did this list, just sort of fictitiously, two items came out on top, right? Work-life balance and career satisfaction. The other one's not that important. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're still pretty high, 17%, so I'm not going to discount them. Uh, but it's not that important. At, earlier in my career, when we made the move from Southern California to Northern California, um, the um, dot bomb occurred, you know, which is you know, when, the, when the, uh, the market collapsed. Career stability was very important to me. I needed, I had three young kids, the first one about to go to college. Um, two more behind it. We had house payments. We had also demands. We wanted to take vacations. We wanted new cars every couple of years. And so stability was very important. I did this last year. Stability did become much less important, which allowed me to rationalize and to justify moving from a Fortune 50 company to the startup. And so this is something that I would advise you to do if you choose this technique. I would advise you to do it over time. You do it a couple of times. By the way, it doesn't have to be on career. Uh, my wife and I did this when we were choosing a home. So where do we want to live at in the area? We, we put together our list, you know, proximity to schools, uh, safety, and so forth. So you can do this kind of technique in a lot of other things, it's just not your career. It's not limited to your career. Once you have that list and you know kind of what's important, then you can start thinking about a career that's, that you would find rewarding that could maximize the benefit. Um, but then the question becomes, OK, I know what career I want to go into. Now, but I don't know where I want to be in that field. Say you choose a field in banking or you choose a field in real estate. How do you know where you want to be? Well, this is a, a second technique I used was, was is just a visualization. Now, I wish there was a software program like Waze that could allow you to navigate to your endpoint. Sadly, there is no such thing. It just doesn't exist. Uh, but it would be very cool, wouldn't it? Maybe somebody can start one up from the CAS school, you know, as soon as they graduate here. Um, and so the idea here is very simple. You pick a future state and a future time. Say you want to be a CEO at age 60. Uh, you know, make it up, whatever works for you. Write down the attributes. Now, this is where the LinkedIn program comes in great handy, because you can look up at LinkedIn. You can read people's bios. You can connect with them. You can ask them about, hey, what are the things that you need to do in your career? And they'll give you those attributes. And, and everybody's uh, CV is going to be different. Some people are going to emphasize you know, the financials, or maybe strategy, or maybe product management. It's going to vary. So maybe there's a couple axes and a couple attributes. And then you cut it in half, and you cut it in half again. And you ask yourself, are you getting the attributes you need to get to that future state? If you are, great. Stay on what you're doing. Deal with it. Maybe it's, there's something about that job that you don't like. But if you all of a sudden get presented an opportunity, and it, it's not any of these attributes on here, you might want to think about that's not what you know, Maybe don't take that opportunity. So again, it's not perfect. It's not, it's not ideal. But this is what I've used. Started about 17 years ago. And it's been useful to me to, to get to there. So at this point now, I want to pivot to, um, to space and uh, you know, the field that I'm, I'm most passionate about. Um, and so the first thing is I just want to talk about the numbers. So how big is it? It's pretty big, $260 billion as of 2016. These numbers just came out a couple months ago. You can see the Kager 
You can see the market segments. It's predominated by the services industry, which makes sense because space is brick and mortar. It's infrastructure. It's the means to provide a capability to people on the earth, just like Stephen Hawking. They want to get science back. You've got to build the satellite to get there. You've got some engineering challenges to get that satellite built. But the, but the value proposition is to bring the science return, bring the science back. They actually call that science return, believe it or not. Um, and, and it's really there to only use, uh, right now, the satellites that are there now are only using one of the properties that space provides. And that property is perspective. And that's what gives you the high resolution imagery you see on the left or the ability to co connect homes together or businesses together or GPS. Every satellite up there is using perspective. There are two other properties I'll talk about in a minute that aren't being used. So think about that, $260 billion, only two properties. The one on the left I love, that's a picture of of a, uh, a human cargo trafficking activity taking place in Asia Pacific, where Digital Globe, a company in uh, Longmont, Colorado, was able to image this ship leaving port, and they were able to track it. They had notified the authorities, the authorities went there, they freed the human cargo. What a great story, I mean, what a wonderful story. Um, and this whole segment is referred to as advanced industries. And advanced industry, you can see the footnote down there, is basically a lot of IRAD is being spent, and a lot of, a lot of people with high degrees in it. Um, and there's about 14 advanced industries in the world. If you look at Brookings Institute and McKinsey did a study, which I participated on a few years ago. So you have uh, a, an advanced industry, and this is why a lot of new nations are looking at space and trying to get involved in space, which is fantastic, because more investment comes in, it's gonna raise the level of humanity, such that I think I agree with what Stephen Hawking said, which was eventually we're either gonna have to figure out how to do better with our energy on the planet, but inevitably we're gonna have to figure out how to get off the planet. Uh, that's what's called a type one planet, if you believe in futurism and so forth. So that's the, that's the business as it is today. Um, and here's the best part. We're about to move into the consumerization space. You might have heard the phrase democratization. I love that word because it says that no longer is the purview of a few countries and now every country can use it. But consumerization to me is more apt because it's really where mainframes were in the 80s to what your iPhone is today. So on the left, you see a mainframe, and uh, obviously that was the main computer. Today, it's your iPhone. Your iPhone is your computer. You don't need a computer anymore. These things on the right are called CubeSats. They're 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And this one's got a couple of them together, so this is maybe a 30 centimeter by 10 by 10. These are relatively inexpensive, about $50,000, which I know is expensive, but compared to you know, a billion dollar satellite, it's, it's, it's a bargain, trust me. And um, you could put these up. There's a company called Planet Labs in San Francisco who built 200 of these last year, launched them. They're called Doves, and they're up there to provide uh, remote sensing, you know, real-time uh, remote sensing of the Earth. And so you can put all kinds of mission on it. Now you've, you've lowered the barrier to entry, and you've created uh, uh, an avenue to enter space which um, didn't exist five years ago. And as a result of that, you've, you're seeing a new, tremendous amount of venture capital going into the market. Up until 2015, about $15 billion were invested in the space. Um, in 2017, this year alone, SoftBank, the Japanese company, committed $1.7 billion to Greg Weiler's company, OneWeb, which is gonna put up three or 4,000 satellites to provide high-speed connectivity, 30 megabits per second at $15 a month. You take a little suitcase, you throw it in your roof, it automatically finds the satellites, tracks it, that's his business model. It's, that's all about access. And, and so that's where these small satellites come in. They're going to mass produce satellites. Up until these satellites were built, the biggest constellation of satellites ever built was Iridium at 77. So you think about that. You know, one-off, we talked about buildings earlier. You know, these are one-off satellites for the most part. You know, 77, so 3,000, 4,000, that's mass production when it comes to spacecraft, which is uh, incredible. And then if you think about this projected forward, and you say, well, okay, that's good, I can get that, that's kind of neat, it's still kind of expensive, but you know, what about the next five or 15 or 25 years? You know, I'm not a futurist, but it doesn't take much of an imagination to look out in the future. I mean, we've got, for example, robotics. On the left is a Canada arm built by the Canadians for the space shuttle. And it was a six degree of freedom arm that went out and grabbed satellites and deployed them and so forth. Um, of course, you're all familiar with the rovers that go on Mars. Those are 100% robotics. 20 minute speed of light change, you can never remotely control that. It's all about artificial intelligence. It's all about deep machine learning before those phrases were ever coined. Um, the picture on the right is a program by DARPA to put up a satellite that's got all these end effectors, which are basically tool belts. It's a tool belt with a bunch of tools to do things from 
repairing satellites, refueling satellites, fixing satellites, and then there are some concepts of you know, pulling out antennas and other things um, to make these satellites more capable. So think about that, project out 10 years with the advance, of, with all this venture capital money going into it. Um, it doesn't take much to think, well, so we can do a lot more. Maybe we can put a factory in space. So I mentioned earlier, there's, there's, we're using or exploiting only the one value that space has today, which is its perspective. Space has two other values. It has the microgravity, perfect spheres, right, which is very important for things like drug delivery systems um, and vacuum properties. You know, it's got a 10 to the 12th tor vacuum in space, which becomes important for silicon. So you can lay down silicon one cell at a time and have ultra pure silicon, you know, surpassing Moore's laws, uh, Moore's law in terms of, of what the chips can do today. So right now, the economics aren't there. Um, I don't know when they will be there. That's a good business case, another business case for the CAS school there. Um, but eventually, you know, you, you can imagine that these other properties, these other capabilities will be in space uh, to, to a certain degree. Um, and then obviously, you know, building human, uh, um, sustainable human cargoes and, and ships of that nature into space. So that $260 billion number I saw, that you saw earlier, you could treble it, you could quadruple it. Again, I, I don't know the time. I once sat next to an economist who said, you always quote a number, but never a date. So I'll say it's going to quadruple at some point, but I won't give you the date. Um, but that's, that's, that to me is really, really nice. And it needs every discipline, lawyers, regulatory, engineers, scientists, program managers. Uh, it needs every discipline you can imagine out there. So this is, a, again, back to the advanced industry. This is a really neat advanced industry. Um, so the final slide I have is um, kind of this, this perspective of this thing we call Earth. And you think about that and you look at that. And, and thank you for the deep breathing treatments earlier, doctor. I really appreciate it. It really helped me calm. <laughs> and when I look at this picture, I get the same sensation. My, my heartbeat goes down, my stress level drops. You don't see borders. You don't see terrorism. You don't see political strife. You don't see any issues. You don't see, of course, you don't see famine and other things that are on this planet of ours. But what you see is a planet with a very, very thin atmosphere, and that's the only thing that's holding us together. That's the only thing that's creating this thing we call life. And so when we look at the space station, and here's an interesting fact for you. Um, if you were born after November 2nd of 2000, humans will have been in space your entire life. I mean, think about that for a minute. On November 2nd, 2000, humans will have been in space your entire life. Um, I can't say that. There's been periods where I, there were no humans in space, but there were periods where there were humans in space. Um, but humans are here to stay in space, is, w is what I'll argue. And, and when you're in the space, right now the space station has all kinds of nationalities. They've had uh, Russians, they've had uh, Chinese, Americans, Europeans, Malaysians, uh, Japanese, uh, other countries. You have to work together. It's all about you working together. So um, space could be a unifier. Now I have to give credit, well credit's due. I was a bit nervous about this too. Um, Professor Hawking gave a, um, uh, a speech when uh, Sir Richard Branson unveiled his spaceship too in the Mojave Desert earlier this year. I was fortunate enough to be invited down there. And uh, Sir Richard Br uh, uh, Branson played this video from Professor Hawking. And Professor Hawking actually coined the phrase, space could be unifier. And as a result, when you look at Spaceship Two, it's now called Unity, which I think is, is just brilliant. So that's my conclusion. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, space is the place to be. Thank you. Thank you.